Good morning, everyone. I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by a, an esteemed panel to talk to me today and Hey Legal about the new paralegal practice certificate course that's been launched by the Law Society of Scotland and Robert Gordon University in Aberdeen. Thank you for joining me. The plan that we have made out is that you're all going to give a brief introductions so the audience knows who you are. Kayleigh, would you like to make a start, please? Hey, good morning. So my name is Kayleigh McLaren. I'm a director at Aberdeen Constein. I have operational responsibility for a very busy convincing department where we work on behalf of a number of corporate clients. Um, our team is large um, and a lot of different backgrounds. A lot of different entry routes into working here at Aberdeen Constein. So really excited about the course because it gives our team members, our employees, a real chance to gain a professional qualification relevant to what they're doing. Thank you very much. Sharon, could you introduce yourself, please? Indeed. Good morning. I'm Sharon Connolly. I'm a Law Society of Scotland accredited paralegal. I'm based with McNabs in Perth and I focus on convincing, commercial convincing. And through my work with the Law Society Paralegal Committee, uh, I've had input into the course design and uh, that's been really interesting and uh, I've really enjoyed that experience. Well, thank you. And David, welcome. Can you just give us a brief introduction, please? Thanks, Ali, and thanks for having us on. Um, I'm David Christie. I'm the Associate Dean for Academic Development and Student Experience in the Law School at Robert Gordon University. And I've led the development of the course to date, uh, at least at the RGU side. But it's been great to work with both Kayleigh and Sharon in the development of it and, and hear what they have to say. Um, I've been at RGU for over 10 years now. And before that, I was a solicitor in private practice. So I have seen real life as well as academia and hopefully bring that sort of influence to bear in the course design. Brilliant. Thank you all. I am very much looking forward to, to, to hearing more about this. I think I said in one of our pre-planning meetings that I get to play the role of asking the very uh, simple uh, daft questions, but there are no daft questions. Uh, and the hope is that the viewers will get to understand quite fundamentally what's involved here and how it might benefit them. Starting right at the very start, so why did you set up this course? There was a tender document came out from the Law Society of Scotland who were looking for partners in developing and delivering a programme for paralegals. The vision in that was to help paralegals to develop themselves and their careers and through that, their role in the various organisations in which they work. So basically benefiting the Scottish legal profession as a whole. We were very interested in that because it seemed to speak to the sort of things that we at RGU are very focused on in terms of workplace education and using our abilities in online uh, delivery to help the Scottish legal profession. I don't know if you listeners know, but we have the only Law Society accredited online LLB in Scotland and also the only online diploma. So delivering legal education online is something we've got a long experience of going over 10 years now. To develop a new programme, aimed at a different section of the Scottish legal professions was a great opportunity for us and one that we really wanted to get involved in. So we responded to that tender. I think uh, the way that these things develop, it was one of the pandemic summers. I, I remember meetings and calls from all sorts of different locations to pull together our tender. Uh, we submitted it. The Law Society were very interested in it and we then had a process of working closely with them in particular Sharon and a number of paralegal committee stakeholders to develop something that would fit the Law Society vision, but also be operationally relevant to paralegals uh, and helping them with a, very much a focus on how to help them to do what we all wanted to try and achieve. Brilliant. Thanks to the Law Society seeking a partner. You come in along in the track record of delivering uh, academic courses online, which is very interesting. The process then starts. I should have said at the start, congratulations on actually creating this course because I do have some experience on that and I know how much it is actually involved in trying to construct something like this. Again, keeping it at the fundamentals, so who should consider doing the course? Can you want to say that again, David? Okay, yeah. I think we're, we're aiming possibly at two quite distinct segments of the market. I think there is a scope in the course for people who are relatively inexperienced to really help build their skills and knowledge off the role of a paralegal and therefore do it better. 
So there are modules in the course which provide a foundational skills for paralegal work, uh, which will also, I think, help them in terms of how to engage with the learning experience, so that's useful. There's also, uh, as you might expect from a law school, uh, introductions to relevant law and also to the relevant professional regulations, and then opportunities to specialise in what are the most popular specialisms for paralegals in Scotland. So um, that would help as a sort of entry-level qualification for those people. It's also, I think, something we're keen to bring on folk who maybe have quite a lot of actual experience, but haven't got a formal qualification. And so it provides an opportunity for them to um, build those skills or to stress test and test their skills against sort of educational criteria through doing the exercises on the course. And I think that's a quite an exciting group to try and, and deliver for, because I think a lot of people maybe don't feel that um, qualifications are for them. They've been doing something for a long time. How can, you know, they'll just need to get on with it. And I think maybe by having a, a, a formal uh, qualification, it will help them then recognize what skills and knowledge they do have and hopefully benefit them just in itself. And also potentially as a next, uh, as a stepping stone to further qualifications, further development of the career in that sense. Um, I also find I've done continued development qualifications and even if you have a sense of what it is the qualifications are very helpful in being able to articulate what you know and show people that you know this stuff there's a real benefit in qualifications in that sense to some extent it's a bit cheesy to call it getting the badge but you can get the badge to show what you're able to do so i think those are the two different groups that we're broadly aiming at and of course if other people are interested happy to discuss with them how it might fit I'll, yeah, I'll jump in here. I think a question I get asked quite a lot. So we have people apply for roles here at the firm from all different backgrounds. Some people have already been to college or university. Some people are fresh out of school. But once they're in the role, they're enjoying the role, they're learning new things. A question we always get asked as an employer is, what can I do to cement this? What can I get? qualification wise that recognizes that I'm a paralegal that recognizes all the work that I'm doing and I think RGU with the Law Society really filled a hole here because there are other courses out there but there aren't many that actually allow you to apply to become an accredited paralegal at the end of it and accreditation benefits both the employee and the employer as far as I'm concerned not only does it develop and help the employee but as a business having um, a team of accredited paralegals is, is very good for our development and growth as well. Yeah, fantastic. Hey, really, thanks. I'm David. Sharma, can I ask your thoughts on this, please? Um, I think, again, I've come to it from, I started out as an office junior many years ago and worked my way up. I did my first paralegal qualification back in 1990. And it's just led to such an interesting and varied career. I hold five different qualifications uh, of paralegal studies. And I think it just gave me personally the, the strength to progress and to develop and to know that I knew stuff and um, gave me the confidence to deal with other agents and colleagues and clients. Design of the, the course as well now, it's far more detailed than it was in my day. <laughs> and it, it really does give the end user that, that real knowledge and confidence to go forward. And I, I have colleagues that will be very interested in this who have been working. Maybe they don't want to necessarily be a, a standalone paralegal, but they just want to cement their own understanding of what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and so the course is really adaptable like that. You know, you don't have to want to, to go off and become a lawyer at the end of doing this and move on to the LLB. It can just be for your own self-achievement. And, and, and it's great that we have the online ability for that because so many of us are working while trying to learn. Um, and so the, the kind of ability to dip in and out at times that are convenient to you is, is, is really good for the end user. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. So absolutely validation for those people who are working in these roles all that they, they may don't have any title and any opportunities around career progression, either internally in your firm or maybe academically moving on if that's what people want. So it's really flexible, which sounds brilliant. I know one of the benefits I have in my job is that I get to see the workings of loads of different law firms and having been a lawyer myself, I know how crucial uh, the, the support staff who are, who are not got a title uh, in a sense in, in terms of, of being a lawyer or paralegal 
how crucial they are to the effect of running of uh, lawyers and clients. So it sounds great. It was part of the Law Society's vision, I know, that we were when we were trying to match it, is that they want to raise the status and profile of paralegals as a distinct group within the profession. So um, it's not just a stepping stone to being a lawyer because paralegals are paralegals for a reason. Uh, and that reason might well be that they don't really want to be a lawyer. And up at the core of what we're doing is was there as a stepping stone to whatever paralegals want to do next. Yeah. Thank you. I'm hoping that the audience watching saying, I'm interested in this sounds like me. I can see myself in uh, what's just been uh, described here. And I suppose the first question that they might have is then, uh, what are the entry requirements? How do I get started? What does this cost? What's the practicalities, please? So the entry requirements are fundamentally, we're looking for a year's worth of work experience. So somebody's got a bit of something about them in terms of seeing what things are like in, in work. Um, if you don't have that, then there are some uh, academic entry requirements um, as an alternative and basically happy to discuss that with anyone that is interested to see how we can help. We're trying to be as open as we can be in entry requirements without leaving people. We need to make an assessment of whether they're you know, going to be able to do the course in a way that's not going to leave them high and dry if they're on the course and they're on, uh, and not able to do it. So um, essentially that year of work experience, we think is enough to get you up and running, to show you're up and running, and then we can help build from there. Um, if you don't have that, then basically let's have a chat. The fees are 2,995 over the two years. So split half of that, whatever the maths is, over the two years, and there is installment payments possible. Uh, again, if that's something you're interested in, again, let's have a chat. You would then apply through, there's an online application portal, which will, handles all of our non-standard, non-UCAS applications. So you would go through that. There's a link for that, which is www.rgu.ac.uk forward slash apply online. If you click through that, I think it's pretty straightforward. I used to deal with an awful lot and it was always fine at the academic side of things. And we got a lot of students through it and it works quite well. There are opportunities for wrinkles to be ironed out and dialogue to happen. And again, if anyone's interested, it, especially because we're sort of looking at some new cohorts, happy to, to help with that and, and nudge things from my side as well. But yeah, online portal apply. If people let me know they've applied, I can try and make sure that it's moved forward as quickly as possible. Um, but in any event, you should hear back pretty soon, uh, whether you're um, apply or not. We don't yet have a closing date for applications. Um, we are looking to fix one potentially mid-December-ish, which will give us a bit of a chance to see who we've got uh, ahead of the course starting in mid-January. I think we would probably take some late applicants too, but we're trying to firm up a sort of soft, a soft deadline, possibly mid-December. We'll look at who's coming in. We've had a number of uh, applications in already, so that's been very encouraging and I'm very happy to see that uh, and hopefully get some more once this podcast goes out. We'd be looking, I think, to have some sort of induction event at the start of things. I think it's important with experience of online delivery that people have had some opportunity to meet each other face to face. And so one of the reasons for fixing the deadline mid-December is to see whereabouts people are. Uh, and if we have an induction event, where it might be, because we, if there's a preponderance in one location, we'll try and cater for that. If there's an even split, we'll try and between various bits, we'll try and cater for that too. Um, but I think there's a real benefit at the outset of being able to talk to people through some of the logistical practicalities of how you access online learning if you haven't done it before, and also to meet each other and to meet people delivering the course, because there's something about the trust that you get face to face that you can't replicate online. Or if you do replicate it online, it takes, it takes a, a few live online sessions to get to that point. And that means that you're wasting energy on building trust rather than just getting on with the learning. So. We'd look to have some sort of induction quite soon and then be delivering online with weekly online live sessions and supporting, supporting recorded lecture material and other reading. Sorry, I think it's fortnightly live sessions supporting, supporting um, by recorded material to take you through the various topics on the course and 
then an assessment which is in the form of an exercise which is reflective and trying to gather in the way in which the student is understanding what they're doing uh, and applying that in their practice as much as they can. Thanks. Definitely got the entry requirement route there in the course and people can probably see that, okay, this is something that maybe I can do or the firm might hopefully support me in relation to this. And you, you mentioned the, the dates of possibly the first cohort and that all sounds eh, fantastic. Can I just delve down a bit, a bit more detail about how the course is delivered and, and the experience of it? Because I think people might be watching, we've talked about busy practices, Kayleigh, you're seeing how busy you are and how busy you are in private practice. And you then say, would love to have this certificate, but how in a practical sense do I actually do it? So if there's live classes, there's work to do. How, how, how can you just tell me a bit more about that, please? Whoever's best qualified, Charlie, would you know or Keely? Yeah, um, I suspect David probably is the, the best to know about that. But I think when we were designing the course, that was one of the, the, the points that kept coming up because the majority of paralegals within uh, either the Law Society a Paralegal Committee or just other paralegals that I know through Scottish Paralegal Association or just people I know have come to it whilst working. And there is that constraint of, family life, work life, and then study on top. And it, it, it is hard, but obviously one hopes that uh, an applicant would have a supportive employer that would perhaps allow them time. But not everyone wants to do it through their employer and may choose to do it themselves just for their own self-development or perhaps they're looking at career progressions out with. And so the course, when we were looking at the hours and time and commitment, the online ability, picking it up, as and when you could. Yes, there would be live sessions and there would be encouragement for that, but they would try and filter that round the round the candidate so that it was accessible, whether that's tea time or a random weekend or something like that. But that very much depended on what the candidates needed and, and the feedback from RGU and, and what their obviously their lecturers and things could do for that. But it's been very much designed with the, the working member in mind. Kayleigh, do you think just in terms of the busy environment that you've described already, people signing up to do the course they were from your company, how, how, how would that play out, do you see? Yeah, so we've had, we've been lucky enough to have David talk to a number of our team already about the course because when it was first voted, there was a huge amount of interest from people already working in the firm. And as Sharon said, I can't speak for all firms, but certainly here, we've got a very supportive culture to, to funded learning schemes and, and, and development of our team. As I said earlier, it benefits them, but it benefits the firm as a whole as well. And I would really hope that other firms would take that approach as well. We understand, um, particularly if you've been out of higher education for a while, I'm not sure I could go back, but particularly when you've been out of higher education for a while, it is an adjustment to go back into it. Not just the academic side, but as Sharon alluded to as well, your family, your personal commitments. We do appreciate there's going to have to be a degree of flexibility. We're hoping we can work with um, RGU on that um, and allow our guys who are keen to do the course the flexibility that they need. Because ultimately, it's a short time period in, in people's careers. You're only asking for a two-year commitment staggered over an academic term. So hopefully we can make it beneficial and work for everyone. Well, that sounds great. And I'm sure there is, there's loads of supportive cultures and firms, and I'm sure this can be worked around, but it could be something that someone watching is thinking, hopefully that's the environment I'm in. And it's great to hear there's flexibility as well from the, the providers. Yeah, um, just um, position as well. on that, we, again, with the experience in delivery online, you know, most of our online students are working. So we're used to creating a structure which works to make sure that there's an incentive to do the studies because I think when Sharon mentions there's work, there's family life, and then there's education on top of that. We don't, we know that education has to fit within that, but also we need to create some sort of structure that allows people to do the education too, because often it will be the one that suffers most when people are trying to balance those things off. So we do have requirements to participate, obviously done with understanding 
of pressure, but to try and make sure that when we have a live session, for example, there is a critical mass of people in that live session because it makes it valuable. I think our preference would be to have that during the working day just for our own delivery. And hopefully that is something that we could students could accommodate. But again, if we're getting preponderance of students where that really doesn't work, then we'll look at that again. And also in terms of the showing of how study fits into the skills involved, it'd be helpful to have a degree of cooperation from the employers. But what we're not asking for is direct employer engagement. One of the things that has fed into this is university experience in delivering graduate apprenticeships, not in law because there isn't one, but in other disciplines. And we're not looking for that level of engagement from an employer where it's a trial part of arrangement. I think what, what we discussed with the paralegals uh, when developing the course was it would be great if the employers are on board and essentially respect the fact that the, the paralegals are doing this work because it's helping them and then the employer, not quite, actually more than indirectly, quite directly. So that hopefully there's some allowance for it. But again, we can look at individual circumstances and see what we can do to fit uh, those individual circumstances in within the structure of uh, the course. And that's something we do uh, regularly with our other online courses. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks, David, for explaining that. Um, you covered the, uh, and I'm interested to hear from any of you about the, uh, the experience of, of the live classes in particular, because I'm thinking about to filter uh, questions through the mind of those watching what's actually involved. So I've got to go into our Zoom call. But many people as it possibly envisaged might be there. Do I need to talk? Do I need to participate? Do I need to have my camera on? Uh, all of the above. So is there any guidance you could provide in relation to that? The, the vision I have, and again, it depends a little bit on what comes next, but is that we would have live online sessions. I think we'd cap them, depends a bit on the numbers, but I think 15 is a decent size for online class. And then we'd have more if need be. And there are various functions now on Zoom that have become quite helpful. Before the pandemic, when I was doing online tutorials, the platform we used was basically unique because there was a little button you could press that showed you putting your hand up. And that became incredibly effective in an online class because it allows people to say they want to speak. I think. We would hope that people would engage uh, and the, the handout function works quite well. And you can, there are various other gizmos like voting buttons and text chat and so on to help people engage. We, we would hope for people to engage in the online live session because that's what it is rather than sitting, listening to the lecture, which would be something where you could do in your own time. Again, I think there's a lot of evidence that having cameras on really helps in terms of the educational benefit of it. So again, we, I think we'd hope that people would put the cameras on, but I think we'd always be happy to hear from people who had difficulties with it for whatever reason. If it's just the, the background behind you is a mess, then I have seen it all and we've all <laughs> seen it all. So th there's nothing that can be surprised by, by that, but you know, there may be other reasons uh, for it. And so if people aren't comfortable, we can discuss that too. Uh, but I think there is a benefit, not just for the teacher, not staring at a series of black squares, but also. If you're on camera, you have to pay attention in a way that you don't necessarily feel you have to pay attention. If you're not on camera, so hopefully we'd do that. There would be, I think, exercises set and scope for discussion, helping to pull out what the key bits are from the various uh, information provided for each topic uh, and to explore that further. And there may be a variety of those things, whether it's going through a problem question type scenario or discussion of an element of practice an opportunity and I think it's an important opportunity just to ask questions about what's going on and a chance to share experiences. One thing that I've found quite effective recently, again, since the sort of pandemic has increased the, uh, the, the scope of online meetings is breakout rooms. And again, there's something quite useful about the breakout rooms, which can provoke discussion among a class, which they don't necessarily, you don't necessarily get when you're just simply calling on people to, to speak. So there are a variety of um, different things to do. I, I should say that the, the colleague who is going to be leading much of the delivery has herself been a paralegal recently. So she has come to the school from that background. And I think that will help in terms of the discussion as well. That's brilliant. There's going to be someone who's has followed that route that's delivering the course because it brings so much insight. Just when you're talking here, I, I do uh, some teaching myself uh, in an online environment and it is 
a game changer when there is interaction and people are involved and they contribute. And I know not everyone wants to do that and that's understandable, but when the opportunity's there, uh, it's great when that happens and it can really change the dynamic. And it's also a great opportunity for people to kind of knowledge share. You know, your firms can obviously be their own world at times. You very much get your working world and there are all sorts of people doing roughly similar things in different environments. It's great, I think, to hear their experience and say, oh, that's, well, that's how we do that or we could do that better or whatever. So that's a great element potentially for employers as well. Kayleigh, would you think, would that be something that would be the ideal of hearing other experiences from people in similar positions? Yeah, de definitely. As I said before, a lot of my team have varied backgrounds when it comes to joining the, the firm here. Some have come from other firms, but some have come from completely different backgrounds initially. So all they've ever known is working here and how we do things here. Now, obviously, I would say how we do things here is perfect, as I'm sure Sharon would say about her firm too. <laughs> but absolutely, it would. it's going to be great for them to hear how other people manage tasks, manage volume, manage clients, um, and, and yeah, talk about within the realms of, of how, how they can and what they're able to share, but share best practices as well and, and talk about these difficult situations or transactions that they've perhaps experienced. Yeah, I think thanks, the, Kayleigh. Chan, yes. Sorry, I was just going to uh, add into that. I think the option to have the kind of live interaction is so important because I, when I did my training, I, I learned lots of different methods. And I think it's something that, we see even in our day-to-day -day practice that people won't necessarily ask something when they're distant, but when they have that face-to-face -face interaction, they will ask that question or they, you know, they maybe save up their questions thinking they'll raise them at some point and then don't raise them. Having the kind of involvement of the live sessions will really hopefully open up any kind of questions or queries or just even hearing maybe if you're not competent to speak up yourself but hearing others speak up maybe they're asking the question you were going to ask or so the interaction is really important in terms of the learning I think and giving support to people so it's really good that the RGU can offer that. Yeah that's brilliant thanks you can see almost picturing success already but a kind of network of people because obviously you're going to get to know the people in a sense who are on your course and if it's just if it's just recorded static content then that interaction is not there so hopefully it's something that really can flow from from the start of the course now we have covered obviously that people have got different motivations in relation to, to completing this course uh, it's not necessarily a conveyor belt to take me from one position to then say yeah, one day I'm going to be a lawyer but for those who maybe are thinking about career progression in the fullest sense could we just cover what routes might be open to those who complete the course either academically or also within firms just that mean it's not necessarily progressing to the LLB or whatever but how we see people developing so if I could ask each of you that question really about how you think somebody who completes this What's it going to do for them? What else can they do? So the first and foremost, obviously, is their own personal development. They'll have this educational certification, um, which they can sing from the hills about. Um, and using that, they'll be able to uh, apply to the Law Society's accredited paralegal uh, scheme and, and look to become accredited. And that accreditation is valuable for firms but also valuable for that individual. It, it gives them the, the kind of seal, if you like, of, yes, you can do the job. You're doing what's expected of a paralegal at that level. Here you go, kind of thing. And, and that's also good from the public's point of view as well, because there's that accreditation. They can look you up in the Law Society uh, website. There's a special accredited paralegal section there. Um, and so it, it's good for everyone. And that comes from having the qualification. There are other routes into the scheme, but the main one is to hold a, an academic qualification. And you can also join the Scottish Paralegal Association as well from holding, from holding a paralegal position. So that's great from that point of view. And obviously just bolstering your own, uh, your own knowledge and, and day to day. Um, thereafter, we'll leave to uh, the other side. Thank you, Sharon. 
Kelly, how do you see success here for the successful candidates? I would definitely echo what Sharon said. It's a personal achievement um, for the individual first and foremost, and really pleased that it's a recognised qualification for paralegal because that has not been at the forefront. As you already alluded to, Ali, you're already asking, what where can they go with it further? I hope a lot of people take it and that's what they want to do and that's the qualification that they want to achieve and not see it in, or not have to see it as a stepping to, stone sorry, to something else. Having said that, if it is a stepping stone to something else, perhaps an alternative route into an LLB or, or an LAM um, at RGU, then that's great as well. Um, it probably hammers home the point that you don't have to get... Um, God, I mean, it was hires back in my days. It still hires now, who knows? <laughs> you don't necessarily have to get the hires at school to be able to get into the career that you want. So if this is a roundabout way of doing it, and having a longer term view that you're going to go off and do the LLB and hopefully secure a traineeship, then great. But I think it's important to note that it's a standalone qualification and a valuable one at that. Fantastic. David? Yeah, I suppose in sort of formal terms, it's the equivalent, the qualification at the same academic level, I think, is the first year of a university degree. So it works at that. It's a certificate in higher education. You can go and do what you want with that. In terms of steps beyond that one of the things i'm going to start looking at is how we dovetail it with other programs within rgu not within the law school we have a, a very well-known business school Aberdeen business school which has a range of degrees which might be the sort of things that the paralegal program could fit into and i need to do a bit of work just to to dovetail that benefit is it's two years away and that even at the way the universities work there's scope to get something set up there so that's something i'm going to start exploring and I start with that rather than the online LLB because I, I've been quite clear that I don't think it should be seen as just a step in that. But we have the online LLB at RGU, which is, although it's not a postgraduate degree, it's graduate entry just because we think that in order to be able to do it, you need to have that experience and knowledge of learning and of yourself to do it. But I will make it that if you've done the paralegal um, certificate, then that will be enough to get onto the online LLB. So and with that experience of working and of juggling work and studies and of studying online, I think that's a natural, that would be a very obvious potential next step for those who wanted to, to pursue it. And then, yeah, hopefully other programs as well. The university, RGU, are looking at uh, expanding its portfolio flexible learning modules across a, a range of areas. And I think very much having that experience of done, having done online learning will help in all of that. And, and there's perhaps more to come uh, in that space in due course. And obviously, I can't speak for how other universities might treat it, but it has the university uh, first year of a, a degree level qualification, which should open doors elsewhere too. That's great. Thanks. Just as you were all talking there, it really did make me think about well, it's lifelong learning, really, isn't it? I know we all live very busy lives and your work's enough and family and all of that stuff, but there are now so many opportunities. Obviously, the delivery in terms of being online really opens up, you know, geography is not the issue any longer. It's not the case of getting there at this time on a November night as we're heading into and all of that and saying, I just don't want to do this. So we can do, can learn in different ways. It's flexible. It's a great qualification in itself. It's a route towards other career progression if that's what someone wants to consider or academic uh, qualification. So I, I, I can't see any uh, downside to it at all. Uh, so. Congratulations to you all for the input that you've clearly had and all the thought and care that's been taken to pull this together. And I hope that those watching feel energised and are ready to become part of the the first cohort. Is there anything else before we wrap up that you'd like to say? Sharon, is there a rallying cry to being a paralegal <laughs> that you'd like to give? Haley, the team that you've got, being diverse, is there anything you'd like to say? David? Uh, academic delivery, is there anything at all you'd like to say uh, that we haven't covered or that you'd like to reinforce? I have worked as a paralegal now for over 30 years and I have thoroughly enjoyed uh, and, and hope to continue to enjoy uh, my career and the opportunities that I, I've had through that and they have been very varied and I, I have always been very well supported by my employers at the time and my colleagues and my family 
if you're thinking about it, definitely make the inquiry. You know, I'm happy to speak to anyone. I know David or any of the Law Society staff would be happy to discuss it as well um, because it's just so worthwhile and it could be the icing on your cake in your day-to-day -day life if you're working in the profession just now. Gives you that confidence. Just do it. Fantastic. Thank you. Healy? How do I follow that? Yeah, <laughs> think very that, passionate um, paralegal. Um, I think a career in law is, is definitely an entertaining one. Um, it's an interesting one. Um, the, the law is all around us um, and, it, and it impacts you probably more than you think on a day or, or weekly basis. So yeah, I think regardless of whether this is a qualification you are attempting because you work in the field or you're interested in getting into the field or you're using it as a stepping stone for a, a further longer term career, then I think it's definitely a worthwhile two years of your time. And as Sharon said, any questions, I'm sure David would be delighted to answer them or, or anybody else at the university. Thank you. And David? I think all through this process, it's been about listening to the paralegal stakeholders and what they and the employers think. And I think I would leave the final word with Kayleigh and Sharon and what they've just said. I don't think I could put it any better. Okay, fantastic. Thank you all so much. As I say, congratulations again on the realisation of this. I wish you every success going forward. It sounds brilliant. Uh, hopefully people watching today and these videos sometimes get watched years after publication, but so they're still watching and saying, oh, this was then before it had even started and I've heard it's a great success and I want to now go and do that as well. So all the very best for what lies ahead. Hopefully the applications flood in and I'll look forward to hearing your progress and maybe we can record at some point in the, in the near future about how it's all going because uh, I'm sure that'd be of great interest to everyone. So thank you all very much for joining me. Thank you.